This is Duke University. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back, black. Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today here in the John Hope Franklin Center with Professor Emily J. Lordy, who's an assistant professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and the author of the new book, Black Resonance, Iconic Women Singers in African American Literature, just published by Rutgers University Press. How are you doing, Emily, today? Doing well, thanks. How are thanks you? Thanks for joining us here at Left of Black. Such a pleasure. Talk a little bit about your book, um, African American Singers mm -hmm. and uh, primarily yes. women singers right. and African American literature. Talk about this kind of connection between music and literature for you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll go a little bit into the background. Mm -hmm. Um, the genesis of the project, it in some ways, you know, has a personal yeah. origin story, as most of our work does. Uh, so for me, you know, growing up as a performer, growing up in dance class, yeah. sort of yeah. wanting to be a dancer and wanting to be a singer as well, and sort of performing in every kind of group, choir, band that I could <laughs> get to let me <laughs> sing in, um, that was a big part of my life as was my love of literature, reading and writing. And it wasn't really until I arrived at grad school that I realized it was possible to, to bring do both of them, right? these yeah, two yeah. passions together. Yeah. So, and, and moreover, that doing so would entail um, this massive education in African American history and culture, yeah. which would really prove to be you know, my life's work. Yeah. So, I'm at Columbia 2001. Um, my mentor there is Robert O'Mealy, yeah. who was a pioneer in the yeah. field of jazz studies. Yes. So yes. a kind of inter interdisciplinary subfield in which scholars, this is the first time that I see scholars are really bringing music right. and literature together. And there's you know, many good reasons for that, not least of which is the fact that African American writers across the tradition, from Frederick Douglass yeah. to James Baldwin to Toni Morrison. Du Bois. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> right. engage with black music, whether that's the spirituals or the blues or jazz. Yeah. However, I also found that in these conversations, in these sort of cross-media analyses, the music that was being privileged was by and large the music created by African-American men. Yeah, right. So the sort of iconic um, Southern blues man, right? Or the jazz hero right. like John Coltrane, Parker, John Parker, Coltrane, Miles, Miles Davis, right, right, Louis right. Armstrong, and a piece of you know, people thinking about Ralph Ellison. And yet, it almost didn't make sense that people were privileging those men because when you read in the tradition, you see that black writers are just as often invoking right. the women, right. Right. Bessie Smith, Billie Holiday, and so on. And so that's kind of where I came in. That's where I, <laughs> where and when I entered that conversation. I'll say just a little bit quickly about my approach to this. Um, it was very important for me as I focused on these connections to not just treat these women singers as muses, sort of inspiring, inspiring muses, men, right, exactly, right. Um, for the writers. I wanted to think about them really as artists at work, you know, as um, innovative, experimental artists who yeah. have agency, yeah. who make choices, who are thinking about what they're doing. Yeah. And at the same time, I realized that writers are often listening to those choices and giving okay. us a crucial language for hearing those performative choices, as well as the social significance of the singer's music. Yeah. And as they're doing that, the writers are also giving us a way of understanding what they are doing in their own fiction and poetry. So they're telling us something really important about the singers, and they're telling us something important about their own literary work. Right. So I'm trying to kind of listen closely to the singers, read the writers closely, and present this musical literary tradition in which, you know, as I say, the expressive innovations of both can resonate most clearly when we hear them together. Did you find examples in which the artists and these writers were able to somehow be in conversation with each other? Yes. I especially found that, I mean, it's so interesting, really, because in most, um, most cases, they are not right. really in conversation. Right. In fact, somebody like James Baldwin writes about Bessie Smith long after she's she has passed. passed. Right. Yeah. Right. Likewise with Gail Jones right. engaging with Billy Holiday, Holiday. Yeah. Gail Jones's 1975 novel Corregidora. However, there are moments of almost kind of, you know, ships in the night, uh, whereby, for example, Ralph Ellison writes a review of Mahalia Jackson's performance yeah. at the 1958 Newport yeah. Folk Festival, Jazz right. Festival, rather. Right. Her iconic moment, really, of yes, her career. Yes, exactly. Yeah. One of these iconic moments, she performs with, with Duke Ellington's orchestra. Yeah. And then she performs at a church, 
the next day. And that's the performance, the latter performance is one that Ellison is really right. excited about. But Ellison is there, you know, he's writing about Mahalia Jackson, and Mahalia Jackson, in fact, attends a panel that Ellison is on. Ellison is there speaking about jazz and American life with other kind of leading literary lights at the time, Sterling Brown, Langston Hughes, and Mahalia Jackson is apparently there. And what's so interesting is that there's a reporter who apparently talks to her afterwards and asks her what she thought, and she says, there's been too much analyzing here and not enough heart. And so in some ways I think, well, that's, that's great. I love that Mahalia Jackson you know, had, she was speaking her own <laughs> right. truth in that moment. It's also something I want to be careful about because it can enforce this gendered binary whereby right. the, the women right. are the ones who, who and, feel and, things and, and the men are thinking. But I, I bring these two writers together or these two artists together in that chapter in order to give us sort of a more um, emotional Ellison and, and a more complicated critical Mahalia Jackson. It, it's ironic, right, because the very critique that, that she makes of the panel, you know, five years later becomes a critique that Ellison makes of Baraka yeah. <laughs> and, they were, and, and blues people, right? You, mm. know, they, they, you know, blues people would give the blues the blues, yes. right, because it was quote unquote, you know, overanalyzing it, yeah. That's true, <laughs> that's true, yeah. You're watching Left of Black, I'm your host Mark Anthony Neal. We're here in the John Hope Franklin Center in our studios. We're joined today by Professor Emily J. Lordy to talk about her new book, Black Resonance, Iconic Women Singers in African American Literature. So I'm gonna tell you what my favorite chapter is. Okay. Um, when I was five years old, uh, my mother was the hugest Aretha Franklin fan, mm. right? All I listened to, all she listened to in the house. And she had heard this recorded poem, Poem for Aretha, by Nikki Giovanni. She went out and bought this album, Truth is on the Way. Yes, um, yes. And so <laughs> I, I literally have listened to that album 1,500 times since I was five years old. Mm. I, I will say that it was, you know, because I heard Nikki Giovanni's performance of it on the song, on, you know, on the album, right. well before I ever read the poem, mm. <laughs> right? You know, I didn't mm. even know there was a literary component to it, right? It was just this album where this woman read this fierce poetry, and one of the pieces was about Aretha Franklin. Yes. And so you write about this, you know, their work, Contemporaries, yeah, exactly. um, you know, Nikki Giovanni's poem for Aretha, mm -hmm. um, the work that Aretha Franklin does in her tribute to Sam Cooke and her version of A Change's Gonna Come, and, yes. and you write them into a black power narrative mm -hmm. in ways that we very often don't think about women's voices in terms of the black power movement, mm -hmm. so talk, black arts movement. You know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, definitely, so thank you. <laughs> um, and that's another perfect example, another chapter that really foregrounds two artists who do know each other. Right. In fact, this is the closest connection that we have. They are contemporaries and, in fact, friends, or at least, you right. know, acquaintances. Right. So that chapter was important for me to think about these women, yes, as sort of um, supporting each other, yeah. these two right. mutually supportive figures who we can definitely think about in terms of a black arts, black power narrative, which, as we know, has historically been imagined to be dominated by male right voices and and in the musical realm by kind of experimental jazz artists but not so much yeah. we haven't so much thought about the popular music that's being produced by people like Aretha Franklin I think that Nikki Giovanni and her poems like poem for Aretha does more than any other artist of the moment to bring Aretha Franklin into a black arts black power narrative yeah. and as you know in that particular poem that poem ends by saying Aretha was the riot, was the leader. If she had said, come, let's do it, it would it have been, been done. done right? Right? Whereas the temptations say, why don't right. we think about it, think when, about it, think about it. When she talks about <laughs> the impact that it has on, on you know, the Diana Rosses and the Dionne Warwicks and the Nancy Wilsons, right? It, right. She changed the game, right? You know, she changed the game. Yes, yes. Uh, but yet we're also left with that line where she, you know, thinks about the trajectory of Aretha's career. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, you know, I don't think young folks can even understand what Aretha was at that moment. I mean, we talk about her as the queen of soul, mm -hmm. you know, in the way that we do now, you know, mm -hmm. as, as this kind of legendary figure. But really from 1967 to 1972, I mean, she may in fact be the most well-known and visible black woman in mm -hmm. the world. Mm. <laughs> you know, it, it, you'd be hard pressed to think about other black women that would have been comparative. I mean, in many ways, she's the Whitney Houston and the Oprah Winfrey of her generation. Yeah. So that when someone Nick, yeah. like Nikki Giovanni, you know, pushes back and goes, you know, she doesn't have to have the kind of life that Billie Holiday did, right? She yes. didn't have the kind of death that Donna Washington did. That's right. You know, it is a critical intervention and one that we don't yes. normally see, right? You know, you, you could imagine if, 
-hmm. any of those male writers would have been able to intervene in how in the lives of say the John Coltrane's yes. <laughs> or the Charlie Parkers in that way. I mean what we mm -hmm. get from those writers are them kind of reflecting on what happened to these folks. Mm -hmm. and Giovanni's working very differently in terms of her intervention with Aretha. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you think about somebody writing a poem now, like for Beyonce, I mean, <laughs> people are going to be mad at me that I even just said Beyonce was, the, you know, the inheritor of Aretha's legacy. But in terms of the, the as you're saying, visibility yeah. and the cultural impact, if somebody were to write a poem saying, listen, let's just let her stay home and she yeah. doesn't have to keep touring. She, she has a child now, you know. This is the kind of thing that, that Giovanni tries to do for Aretha Franklin in that moment is to say, you know, there are all these other artists just waiting in the wings. Right. Let's deal, <laughs> let's deal with them and, right. and let kind the of let the James is as you talk about at the end of the book. Yes, book. yes, exactly. So it is very important. So I'm really interested in the way that she um, highlights Aretha Franklin as this crucial figure that precisely because she's so important, we need to respect right. and to honor her space and her time, but also the way that she helps us to hear Aretha Franklin's yeah. music itself. So for example, in that poem for Aretha, she has these lines that go on forever. So I, I see <laughs> that the way that the lines work on the page gives us a way of understanding Aretha Franklin's own, what we might think of as her kind of lyrical enjambment, the way right. that she has this incredible flow, especially when she's ad-limbing a, a song like her version of Sam Cooke's mm -hmm. Change right. is gonna come. Right. And especially in the ending section, you know, as she's sort of vamping out over Spooner Oldham's yeah. organ and yeah. she just yeah. goes on and on. And I think that Nikki Giovanni really helps us in terms of her own poetic form to hear some of the incredible yeah, innovations yeah. that Franklin is making. We, you know, we've been talking about this kind of connection between literature and music. A, a few years ago, Ed Pavlik, you know, my friend down at the University of Georgia, yeah. uh, did a wonderful book um, about Donny Hathaway. Right, mm -hmm. you know, not yeah. having any really real archival material, recreating Donny Hathaway's life for us, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in the poetic realm. Um, you also have a, a deep interest in Donny Hathaway. Talk about mm -hmm. your interest in Donny Hathaway. Yeah, sure. So I love that book by by Ed Pavlik, um, the song for Donny Hathaway. And I teach that that book, and that is so important in part because there is no other book on Donny Hathaway. And just even the bibliography alone that, yeah. that he gives yeah. us at the end of that book, it's like you could tell he right. read every, every interview, every piece, review right, right, right. that he could possibly find. And yeah, so Donny Hathaway for me is important in so many ways, but. You know, I think you, you touch on this a little bit too in your work on Hathaway, just the fact that in the midst of this very kind of masculine soul moment, Donny Hathaway was never afraid to be vulnerable, yeah. right? To, to be beautiful. I mean, just the most gorgeous melodies and the way that his voice could soar, the way yeah. that he could really transform a song and, and give it new life, give it breath. And, and then also too, how many different things he could do, yeah. right? The range of emotion, but also the range of musical idioms that he mastered from, you know, coming out of the, the black church, of course, but also the blues, you know, his interest in classical music um, and really, truly mastery of these different forms. So I think about him alongside somebody like Nina Simone, who was also just, you know, a wildly kind of integrative talent and in doing that is going to help me in my next book to think in a more complicated way yeah. about soul music itself. We're here with Emily Lordy uh, here in the John Hope Franklin Center left the Black Studios talking about her new book Black Resonance Iconic Women Singers in African American Literature just published by Rutgers University Press. Talk a little bit about the contemporary music scene. Um, two artists uh, and two artists that I know you've written about fairly recently. Okay. Miss yes. um, Beyonce Knowles Carter mm -hmm. um, and Bilal. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in particular, you know, because, you know, Bilal is a kind of an acquired taste. You know, everybody in the world knows who Beyonce is. A very smaller segment of folks know who Bilal is. Mm -hmm. Talk about the significance of a vocalist like Bilal, particularly in the context of both a soul and jazz tradition, you know, at this point. Yes, absolutely. And so Bilal comes out of sort of both of these traditions, right? He's in some ways a musical school nerd. Yeah, he's, he's a jazz nerd. <laughs> And you can see how much he has learned from his engagement with jazz musicians right. from the Robert tradition. Robert Glassbar. Exactly, right. is a perfect example. And he talks in an interview with Michael Gonzalez, I believe it is, about how what his training in jazz helped him to see is that there are no <laughs> wrong notes, <laughs> right? Is that it's just a matter of what you do yeah. with with those notes. And so the the trust that, that he has in his own artistic process, and also I think very important with Bilal is the trust that he has in his collaborators. Right. I think that that's something that's very important in his aesthetic, and, and it, we can see it in terms of a jazz tradition, right? Where you have to, of course, work with and against you know these other yeah. people. Um, 
So I see that, and, and I also see him coming out of out of the soul tradition, this kind of like take no prisoners approach yeah. to vocal yeah. performance. Yeah. And those people who have seen him live will know that he's astonishingly good live. Yeah. I mean, yeah. seriously, this man can do anything. And so that's also part of my interest in Bilal is just that sheer virtuosity. What is the challenge of being that kind of artist, you mm -hmm. know, within an industry that always wants to label people and yeah. put them in nice little boxes so you can market them? Um, you know, Bilal, you can't hear Bilal on the radio. I mean, even right. when he was still more of a traditional r and at least being marketed as a traditional R&B singer, yeah. you didn't hear a lot of Bilal on the radio, right? Yes. Even, if, even if this was a neo-soul moment and you could hear music all the time, you could hear Jill yeah. Scott, you know, you weren't hearing yeah. Bilal. You know, mm -hmm. what does it mean to be that kind of artist in this kind of contemporary moment? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's difficult. I think in some ways, what Bilal has done is to collaborate. You know, he's, a, he's featured on all these different yeah, artists' yeah. albums, so Glasper is a good example. Right. Even Jay-Z, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, he, yeah, you know, he yeah, shows exactly. shows up on American Gangster, right? Yeah, yeah, he really is everywhere. And so it's kind of like you're going to see a little bit of Bilal somewhere, <laughs> whether you expect to or not, right? right? right. Um, but I do think that it's difficult. I do think that a lot of it has to do with it, the you know, difficulty of just sort of placing him in a box. I think that Donny Hathaway is somebody who encountered a similar kind right. of problem, right. right, is that he simply would not be categorized. He defied categorization. And we, you know, as critics, love that, but right. I think it can be very, very difficult. So, you know, when we think about somebody like Beyonce, who is now trying to break out of her own right. box, and I wanted to celebrate her, her attempt to, to do that, to do something very diff different, not only kind of in terms of the messages, yeah. the content of her, of her music, but also in terms of this different aesthetic. And talking about Beyonce, um, and, and in your writing on Beyonce, I mean, you refuse to buy into this conversation around Beyonce and feminism, mm -hmm. right? Almost as if mm -hmm. it, it's a false <laughs> framing of, of her work, right? Yeah. Um, you know, that there's a, a lot of latitude, both in terms of how we think about feminism and how an artist like Beyonce, given who she is, how she's going to embrace it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, you get back to just the art mm -hmm. of that album. Um, you know, talk a little bit about why that album, when all is said and done, six albums into her career, mm -hmm. why this was really a significant artistic statement for her. Sure. So. I should say that I don't really have a problem with people who want to analyze Beyonce in terms of feminism right. and is it feminist or not. I do not, however, think that that's the most interesting question that we can yeah. ask about that right. album by any means. I mean, there are so many other things that we could wonder about in terms of that album. You know, um, what about Beyonce's use of humor on that right. album, which comes through so much more clearly in on Beyonce, the, the new album, than, than elsewhere, this kind of weird, uh, almost kind of off-kilter, strange yeah. humor that she has with the repetition of the word surfboard, for example, right. uh, in Junk and Love. So, so we can ask about that. We can ask about motherhood. We could ask about, you know, her collaborations. Why is she collaborating with Drake and Frank Ocean on this right. album, these younger artists, right. right? There's a whole range of things that I think if we just fixate on, is this a good or bad feminist performance, we're really going right. to miss. So right. for me, and I think this is probably true of my critical project in general, it's very important for me. What I can bring to the table is an interest in detail. Getting down to the nitty gritty and thinking about how Beyonce performs particular songs. Right. You close know, the reading. Production, right. The close right. reading, exactly. Right. I think it's, it's so valuable. And when we do that, I think that we can see that what she is really offering in this album is an insistence on a private life, which of course she's performing it, right? Like she does everything <laughs> right. in, in large terms um, in, in a spectacular way, but she's performing an insistence on a private life that can be just as sort of dark and twisted and beautiful and fantastic as somebody like Kanye West's yeah. private life, as yeah. Drake's private life, yeah. as for that matter, Bruno Mars, you know, and some of his <laughs> like very out there kind of, you know, um, scandalous yeah. in some ways, performances of sexuality. And Beyonce saying, I can do that too. And in that way, I think it's a powerful yeah. black feminist yeah. performance, but we're not gonna really get there unless we think carefully about what all she is doing in the variety of emotions and fantasies that she is laying claim yeah. to on that album and saying, ultimately, this is all Beyonce. And that's yeah. why the title is such a stroke of genius, is it's saying, this is it all just, me, just right? right? Yeah. We've been joined today by Professor Emily Lordy, 
assistant professor of English at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, author of the new book, Black Resonance, Iconic Women Singers in African American Literature. Thanks for joining us today, Emily. Thanks so much for having me. Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black, 